Good morning. So I have a different uh, perspective, uh, and it's we'll talk about research with intent. Um, so we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, certain aspects of research. There's a lot of research going on. So I only have a certain amount of focus today that we've talked about, but I can assure you there's so much going on in the field. A lot of my information came from uh, NIH information, so you can actually even look up what's public domains as well, and there's certain things that are available, um, but you'll have access to these slides as well. So first and foremost, we have current therapies that exist, and we actually have quite a lot. We have a majority of, of us would know that we have carbidopa, levodopa, and there's different formulations of it. We have our dopamine agonists, and they have their utility as well. All of these medications typically play well together in sandbox, as we say. And the goal is to maintain and sustain dopamine throughout the system, but it's not the only actual neurotransmitter that's affected in, in this disease. But we have, again, boosters to sustain it, enzyme blockers to maintain the integrity of the, of the medication in our system. We have other therapies that have existed over time to help with tremors. We call them anticholinergics, but we've known that they're very nonspecific and had, can have a lot of side effects. So as time has gone on, we've gotten more, and more specific for therapies. We have a adenosine 2A antagonist, and this lecture may be a little bit uh, very detailed as far as terminology, but the point is that we're getting more and more specific in our therapies, okay? So it, we would, we're kind of behind the world of oncology. Before, we would have some chemotherapy agents for oncology that would try to destroy as many bad cells, right? However, it would also affect our good cells. And now we've got very specific immunotherapy in the world of oncology. Well, we get, we're getting there in Parkinson's. It's taking a little bit of time, but we're getting there. So again, we do have a lot of therapies there. You see that in the gray, but what we're gonna be talking about is these therapies are focusing right now on motor symptoms, tremors, stiffness, slowness. Dopamine may, may help mood, it may help certain aspects of thinking, it may, may help us process better, sleep better, but it's not really yet helping um, control the actual disease state as, and how it's progressing. So what we know is there are genetic factors involved, correct? We all have genes, we all may have genes that are affected, that may promote us to develop something like Parkinson's in the future. What unlocks those genes, we don't know either, right? We're, but we understand that some of us may have genes. Somewhere around 10% of patients will have, so somewhere about 10% of patients who develop Parkinson's, it may be genetic factors, okay? It may be. We believe the majority of factors that we're exposed to is actually genetic, is, is environmental, that then may unlock some of these genetic factors. So there are genes that we're gonna be focusing on today. There's some ones like LARC2, this is something that is called leucine-rich repeat kinase 2 genes. Don't ask me to repeat that over and over again. But that's LARC2 is common in certain populations. Why is this important? Because we're trying to target that gene as well. The more we understand about this gene, maybe we can slow down the progression of alpha-synuclein, which creates problems. So alpha-synuclein is a protein, but how do you make a protein? You need to have a gene that then creates messengers that then creates the protein that then spreads throughout the system. There's other genes like GBA, which we see in other disease states, and they again affect alpha-synuclein. We all have alpha-synuclein in our system, predominantly in our gut, our GI system. We have a lot of this version where it's safe, not a bad toxic version of it. When it gets changed and modified, it becomes toxic, okay? There are different factors that makes this toxic and then it spreads into our central nervous system and then affects our peripheral nerves, affects our central nerves, and it spreads, okay? So what makes this turn into this? Can be genetics, can be environmental toxins. What things do we put into our system that can affect this? Could be certain foods, certain exposures, Right? So that's where the topic of today's research is going, is where is our studies for genes to stop the progression of the disease state, and what can we do to prevent maybe the aggregation of these abnormal proteins from spreading? Now, you've, if you guys have been reading up on Parkinson's, 
you'll know that one of the abnormal things about the disease state is the proteins that spread, alpha-synuclein, right? You guys have heard of it? Raise your hand if you've heard of alpha-synuclein, right? It's on my dartboard at home. So, but that is not the only abnormal protein. It's really, really important to know that there's something called amyloid beta sheets, there's tau, there's TDP. These, these are all other proteins in other disease states. We see TDP in ALS, but it's also in Parkinson's. We see amyloid in Alzheimer's, but it's also seen in Parkinson's, especially with progression with cognitive decline. And we also see tauopathies, which are different versions of Parkinson's that exist too. So it's not just that we have alpha-synuclein, but that all these genes play a role and how we progress with Parkinson's is actually quite different, depending on how these proteins are spreading. So if we can maybe stop this gene from activating proteins, maybe we won't have cognitive decline. Maybe if we can stop the associated TDP, maybe we won't progress as fast and be as weak. With tauopathies, maybe we won't see a different pathway where it's affecting our bladder system, our blood pressure system, so there, again, is more than just focusing on one aspect of alpha-synuclein. But there are many genes that create alpha-synuclein to spread. One of them, again, is the SNAC gene and then the Parkin gene. With the Parkin gene, you see this more in young onset. Now, we don't have ways yet to get genetic testing to then change and modify the disease state yet. But that's actually where we're heading, and that's where we're going to see that the future is very specific for. Now you're going to say, why is he talking about all these different genes? How does this help and affect research? Well, we need to stop these proteins from spreading. And how can you stop these proteins from spreading? There's a study right now that's going on. It's in clinical phases. It's actually phase two. And this butanatib is it's a molecule that will stop abnormal, like our normal cells under stress from being broken down. So number one is it's been shown to be safe in the phase one studies. It was tolerated at certain dosages. Now we'll simplify it. You have our normal mRNA, which again is genes, mRNA creates proteins. If there's no stress on the system, no abnormal proteins. When you have stress on the system, whether it's, you know, certain neurotoxic aspects of the disease. We can put stress under exposures of toxins we may be expo exposed to. For instance, someone may be exposed to Roundup, for instance, right? It irritates, injures cells, and we create proteins. Well, this therapy binds to part of the mRNA so you don't even create these proteins. That's pretty impressive. So we're going very specific in knowing that we can slow down and these uh, pathways that are degenerating from stress on the system. Again, 90% of our Parkinson's is due to environmental toxins. This could be something that could be hopeful. So hopefully today you're not just getting information, but you're getting hope because there's a lot of things that are in the works, a lot of labs all around. There's a medication that works on vasospasms. We don't have it available here in the U.S. It's been in Japan. And what happens is, again, we have different models that affect the system. So we use like different rat models to imitate how the Parkinson's genes uh, are affected or how alpha synuclein spreads. So we put stress on the system, and then we create abnormal cells, and then our neurons in the brain, they degenerate. Well, we have a therapy that's being worked on right now called Fosadil. And it, we believe that it can block certain enzymes that then degenerate these neurons. Not only does it stop the degeneration, it actually promotes growth of these extensions of good neurons. So that's actually very impressive. We're not only stopping something, but we're helping the inflammation that's there and then also regrowing. So there may be some benefit there. And then as, if the cell's not dying, it's staying alive. Okay, if it's, not staying, if it's staying alive, then it won't be broken down and then creates abnormal proteins that also spread. So it's more than just one problem. There's a cascade of issues that happen. So that's being worked on. And then potentially with also certain amino acids, it can work even more effectively. Okay, stem cells. There's too much information about stem cells, but we don't have yet the answers for it, okay? I just brought up information about four or five different sites 
uh, in the world. There are probably, I mean, and Dr. Duma can even talk about this more because he's also doing some studies with Alzheimer's, but there's more than 100 sites in the, in the US and in the world that are working on stem cells. They're all very different. They're trying to be coordinated, but they're utilizing different types of pluripotent cells, which may, may be from yourself, from your skin, from your blood, embryonic cells, and we're trying to find out which is the most ideal way of it being developed, okay? Now, the majority of studies are with the stem cells, it has to be implanted. So if someone says we have so many thousands of dollars you can give us and you can go to Mexico and we'll give you some stem cells that may not work through an IV. Again, it has to go to a center, go to a place that's been reputable, that's actually being studied and having phase one, phase two studies and developments into phase three studies. We do know that there are many centers that are working together concordantly to develop a protocol to transplant these stem cells properly where they need to be and then monitoring. So not only are we just putting in the stem cells, we're making sure that they're not overgrowing and causing cancer, right? There's different ways of programming these cells. That's one part of the research. Second aspect of it is when you put in stem cells, there's certain therapies that are there so that you don't have to have immunosuppression for it, which also can be negative for you, puts you at harm. And then there's other aspects of the research that make sure that alpha-synuclein and tauopathies and all these other abnormal proteins don't get into stem cells. So there's a lot more to it than just, here, let's put in stem cells. A lot of research is going behind that. Now, something most likely next year will have two forms of continuous pumps, subcutaneously, through the skin. We've had success with patients who have been on uh, Duopa, which allows us to get d dopamine continuously through a JPEG tube, and it's been helpful for patients who are, again, very responsive. However, there's other ways of therapy that may come out subcutaneously. So, again, we're, we're behind in the world in neurology versus oncology, and we're a decade or so behind the endocrine world, where we're now getting these type of dopamine pumps, like insulin pumps. So this will kind of look like the old insulin pumps. And it's been shown that we can sustain the benefit of on time without having pills wear off, right? We have more continuous delivery, which would be amazing for patients. How many times do we forget to sometimes take our pills? Well, we may not have to have that issue with this. And this is very close to being uh, available next year, OK? And then along with this, another uh, levodopa uh, form that will be potentially available next year as well. The other clinical studies is looking at non-invasive ways of, instead of putting in a deep brain stimulator, um, which we know can be extremely therapeutic for motor symptoms, and instead of using focus ultrasound to reduce tremor, there's other studies that are working on what's called transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS. You may have heard of this in the world of depression, but this is being studied in the world of Parkinson's for what's called neuroplasticity, to keep things working efficiently, okay? So maybe we can't stop a disease state, but we can make the neurons work more efficiently. It's kind of like exercise for the brain, but there, there is some stimulation that's provided. It's, on the, core, it's on, the, on the skin, and it delivers a type of therapy that, again, should help the subthalamic nucleus and certain parts of the cortex. The way that they're looking at it is it may help with gait initiation, it may help with reactive balance, it may help with slowness of movement and potentially rigidity. Ambroxyl. So this is a medication that is used for clearing your sputum. Okay. Now, it's not available here in the U.S. A lot of things aren't available in the U.S. You can't get it on Amazon. So <laughs> this, again, is important because... We talked about genes earlier. One of the important genes is GBA. And that type of gene, when it unlocks its proteins, it causes a spread again. But we may be able to stop those proteins. Where the, it causes a problem is in the lysosome, which is the clearing agent, kind of the trash can of the system that helps clear out abnormal products within our cells and neurons. So Ambroxol has been shown to maybe slow down the aggregation of abnormal proteins, specifically alpha-synuclein. And there's pretty good data that came out from phase one from safety and phase two being in the works as well. Uh, this is being studied quite a bit right now in Europe. 
And so as far as a disease modifying agent, this may be something that may be useful. So we may not cure the disease, but we may slow down aspects of it, which would be pretty impressive. Okay, so next thing is deep brain stimulation. We already have deep brain stimulation, but we're getting more and more efficient ways of utilizing it. So we know where to implant the leads. It works very effectively for those that are great candidates. They're getting smaller devices. You don't have to even have necessarily the battery on the chest wall anymore and deliver the stimulation. It's going to be under the skin near the skull aspects. And then this, it's a shorter area, so there's less, less issues of infection, less issues of potential lead breaks. But what's more impressive is it's called a closed loop system. So we can, right now there is a company that's available that can sense the brain waves right now. And with that sense, sensing of brain waves, you can tell when there's active signals showing that you have tremor or stiffness or slowness. And then you can then stimulate that area. So a patient comes into our clinic, we're able to, for those patients with that DBS, we can actually look at their brain waves. We can actually tell when someone woke up. We can actually tell when they're having more symptoms throughout the day. And then we're able to change the stimulation pattern to then suppress those abnormal signals. Okay? Now what's going to be really impressive is we don't have to do that anymore. We can just set parameters and then the stimulator will see those abnormal signals and then, and then allow for signaling to be increased. And then when you go to sleep, it just reduces the power so it doesn't have to work. And then when you wake up or you have certain aspects of your day that the signals are there, then it can help with, again, turning on. So it's pretty impressive. It's called closed loop DBS. So this is effects of fecal microbiota transporting. Our gut has a lot of healthy bacteria. As the disease progresses, we may have changes in our gut pathology. Well, we do, I shouldn't say we may, we do have changes in our gut. Who's here had some antibiotics in the last year? Right? Antibiotics are pretty prevalent and they may kill our own gut lining. I know we need it for certain aspects, but it can also kill our gut lining. Time and accumulation, maybe we have abnormal growth of bad bacteria as opposed to our good bacteria. So when we take antibiotics, we may kill it. There are studies that are shown that in Parkinson's disease, we have certain probiotics, so to speak, certain types of enzymes that are there that get destroyed or reduced. And we can maybe take probiotics that's still being researched as to what's the ideal aspect, but it's becoming more individualized. There's companies out there that actually are doing research to say, you're low on this specific type of enzymes, you need to have this type of tablets or probiotics. Versus another company, another company may say, okay, well, you send us our stool sample, your stool sample, and we can see where you're having deficits, okay? But this is the real world, and you can actually then, there's studies that have been show, are being worked on right now with Parkinson's to see if you can get healthy bacteria from stool samples that are then implanted into the GI system and see how it changes mood, sleep cycles, absorption of nutrients, as well as our medicines. So this is already existing for people who already have had problems with antibiotic resistance and developing other bacteria that's grown. So this is being studied right now in Parkinson's, and there's a lot of good evidence that's come out of it. The other aspect of study is tributyrin. <laughs> It's seen in margarine and butter. So it works as uh, helping develop more short chain fatty acids into our GI system, which is again very healthy for us. It allows for keeping the integrity of the blood brain barrier. It allows for regulation of the GI system. It helps with pro inflammation. And it again allows for neurotransmitters to maintain their integrity. So there's something about small chain how you eat and what you're eating and how that helps your GI system, but very specifically small chain fatty acids. And this is being studied, uh, it's a small pilot study that's being studied uh, to see if it can help with disease progression. Dr. Bixby talked about certain SSRIs, serotonin specific reuptake inhibitors, which are part of management with depression and Parkinson's disease as well. Well, there's a study that's going on with one of them called citalopram, and it's compared against placebo. And it's looking to see how it affects the visual cortex pathways of the brain. So what happens with Parkinson's, as I talked about earlier, you may have seen that slide about amyloid uh, protein. 
amyloid seen in more of the Alzheimer's world. As Parkinson's disease progresses, yes, we get motor symptoms, but we also get cognitive issues, right? We're slowness in processing. We may misinterpret things that we see in the visual cortex. That's not affected necessarily by dopamine pathways, but serotonin pathways. So this research is working on to look at how serotonin affects cognitive processing, and it may help starting this maybe earlier to reduce the risk of mild cognitive impairment developing. As far as non-motor symptoms for sleep, for energy, for, uh, for uh, reducing daytime sleepiness, uh, that is looking at bright light therapy, and again, different frequencies that we can utilize and when to utilize it and how effective it can be for helping with, with depression, again, with sleep. So this is being studied actually in numerous, numerous sites around the world. Uh, I think this could be very helpful for certain aspects as, as opposed to needing more caffeine or Adderall or whatever we may give. Something like this may help with daytime sleepiness. And then riboside, so nicotinic riboside. So this is vitamin B, B3. I don't want you guys going out and just buying all the B vitamins right now. But, but this is a study that's working on B3, and it's looking to see the dosage that can be beneficial and can help in the cerebrospinal fluid in reducing abnormal alpha-synuclein. Uh, there's certain data that has shown that if you have a certain amount of NAD, again, vitamin B3, it's been shown on PET scans that it had improvement in cognitive aspects in patients with Parkinson's. This, is, this doesn't have a name to it except for a number, R07. We'll leave it at that. And this is an early phase study. This one's really unique because it's working to see with early Parkinson's as a disease progression, it's looking to see if there's ways of reducing inflammation in the brain. Again, I've talked a lot about inflammation because a lot of these genes that become proteins cause inflammation in the brain. That, this is working on a specific protein uh, called NLRP3, which may exacerbate alpha-synuclein from spreading. So it's not just that protein spreads, but proteins affect other proteins that affect other proteins that spread. And so this is something that may be neuroprotective. Uh, it can be very important for the brain and lower inflammation early on. <coughs> now I talked about antibiotics that can be maybe bad for you and your GI system. There was actually a study, it actually started off in, I think, South America. It could have been in Brazil or Argentina. And there was a patient who was not doing so well, had some infection, was put on doxycycline, and got like, his symptoms got extremely better. And it was lasting for maybe two or three weeks, but there was a total difference in his symptomatology that there's been more, more studies about, again, reducing inflammation with certain antibiotics. So doxycycline in patients who are already on levodopa, how, did, how does it help motor and cognitive symptoms? And patients are then followed up four to eight weeks after, and depending on how they look and there may be, again, anti-inflammatory pathways that are maybe protective, not just in the GI system, but it may affect how it gets to their brain. Potentially next year or the year after, we're going to get a new dopamine-specific therapy for D1, D5. This is a dopamine agonist. We have currently dopamine agonists that exist, but they focus on D2 and D3 receptors. So we have, when we take levodopa, it may touch upon all of these different receptors. There's some other medicines that we take that may focus on maybe one of them or two of them. But ideally, we want to really focus on D1 and D5 receptors for Parkinson's to help motor symptoms, okay? When we affect certain aspects of D2 or D3, it may help us feel good. Sometimes we feel too good, and we inappropriately have what's called impulsive behaviors, and we can buy things, shop for things that we don't need to, or we can't control our hobbies, and we're spending maybe too much money on cars or shoes or whatever it may be that we have hobbies on. So this is a new therapy, novel specific dopamine agonist that doesn't, should not have those severe, severity of side effects and it focuses very specifically for D1, D5 receptors. So again, very, this could be very unique for us next year. Another specific type of therapy, this is called talineurin. This is a way, there's, there's two cool things about this. Number one is it may allow for therapeutics to cross the blood-brain barrier and get to the brain to then be much more specific. So we may not need high doses of levodopa, potentially. We can actually use maybe a fraction of it. So if you, when you take a medication of, such as carbidopa levodopa, 
anywhere from 2 to 5% of it actually gets to the brain. So imagine if we can take a quarter of it, or even maybe one fifth, one, one twentieth of it, and then we can package it into these lipoproteins and it gets to the brain, it's more effective. So we, that can be quite unique as a therapy. Second component about this is there are, this specific uh, molecule works at the glycocerebrosidase areas of GB1, and it actually may help to slow down inflammation pathways and it crosses the blood-brain barrier a lot easier. Insulin can also be very pro-anti-inflammatory. So we know it reduces inflammation from diabetes, but we don't want the problems or side effects of having low sugar, right? We need to keep maintenance in Parkinson's. We need to make sure we're not too hot or too cold. We don't want our blood pressures too high or too low. We definitely don't want our sugars dropping. But there's data that was seen in, in the Alzheimer's world that intranasal insulin help with cognitive impairment. It's also being studied in Parkinson's. There can be some utility that, again, there's problems sometimes of getting through the blood-brain barrier, so if we can get it in a faster route and more efficient route, this could be of utility. So not too much cookies and snacks, because it could be very inflammatory for our brain. There's a lot here. I'm going to simplify this. So we know that we have alpha-synuclein, that's stress on the system. It's normal until it's abnormal, becomes plaques and becomes, changes its molecular structure. And then it gets into the system, but what actually triggers that change and confirmation of alpha-synuclein that's in a non-stable, in a, in a stable state becoming abnormally stable? There's something called c -able. okay? It's a protein, it's a sentinel protein that, that's in your gut it's a scavenger protein in your gut that then creates alpha synuclein to spread past the blood-brain barrier, and it gets to the brain. Okay, so it's not, again, simple as just one abnormal protein. It's proteins that affect proteins. So there's a study that's out there, IKT, and it's an oral medication. It's a C-able tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And the way it works is it stops that C-able protein from from uh, reaching, let's say, uh, the alpha-synuclein, and if it, if it can stop it from reaching alpha-synuclein or prevents the uh, connection of that, it cannot allow for the pr progression of symptoms. So they did this in a mouse model, and what they did was they gave mice uh, toxic levels of alpha-synuclein, and they showed that if you didn't give this medication to block C-alpha, C, um, sorry, C able, then you had abnormal protein developing. When you gave different doses of it, it blocked the change of alpha synuclein spreading throughout the system in the rats. And then the rats were able to move, or mice were able to move faster. So it was very direct, and that's pretty unique because there's two major studies. One, this one's in Korea, but there's other studies also going on. And this one's really unique because Many years ago, there was a study called nitolinib. It was for cancer, and it worked specifically on the c able protein. But it had some side effects. It didn't really pan out the way we wanted in Parkinson's disease. It may have caused maybe some other issues. Well, this is similar to that, but a little bit more specific, and may have a better duration of effect with less side effects. And it could be helpful in reducing c able and that may, again, slow down the progression of disease. So hopefully. That was enough information, sufficient information, not too much information that your head's spinning. All right, but that's, that's, the, that's the research for now that I can talk about.